big hello and welcome to RJ Sanderson TV, episode three for 2022. There's plenty going on, a federal election, interest rates are on the move. Uh, Roy Sanderson's back and uh, can you believe it, the Blues have had another win as well, Roy. Uh, it's, uh, it's been an interesting month, but a great week uh, for the Blues again. It is, Dave. We, we're not here to talk footy, let's be honest, but uh, keep a lid on it. Uh, we're walking tall and may will be an interesting month to see what happens in football. I, I've seen you frazzled before, but, um, you know, you are unflappable after the Blues have had a win. You, you mentioned walking tall. I think you walked the tallest of all um, after the Blues have had a win. You're like a different person. Uh, it does. I think all Carlton supporters are a bit hungry for success and... Um, just to be in the 80s is uh, a great relief because we know we've been knocking on the door for a while. Roy, uh, April, it's been, or April and into early May, it's been an interesting uh, month, as, as I mentioned off the top, the federal election. So there's a lot of money and announcements and everything flying around. Um, just generally, what have you made of the last month since we were last on RJ Sanderson TV? Uh, it's been in interesting given that we have elections, um, there's been budgets, uh, federal and state money being spent, um, I think it's an interesting time. So cert certainly we'll see some stats very soon that uh, will enforce that. Yeah, let's get into some of those stats with uh, our news headlines because, as you say, um, I, I feel like the economy is in a precarious position. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly, um, you know, some money that's flying around, there's stimulus being given out, etc. cetera. Um, but, but also I feel like in the community, there's some concerns. So I think that's illustrated in, in some of the numbers. But the big talking point, Roy, is that uh, after we've uh, spoken about it for the last couple of years, the Reserve Bank has increased interest rates for the first time in 16 months. So uh, we see there that you can see on, on the graph a flat line where the interest rate was uh, at historical lows of 0.1%. It has been increased 25 basis points by the Reserve Bank to a new interest rate of 0.35%, the first rate hike um, uh, since uh, for, for, a long, for a long, long time. Dave, I hope we never get back to the days when they were at their, their highest peak. Some of us at my vintage certainly remember that happening. Um, I think there's going to be a couple more rate rises at least to this year to try and stem the inflation rate. This is the first rate rise since November um, 2010, Roy. So you can see on that graph there that all of those have been rate decreases. The graph doesn't actually extend to the last time that we had a rate rise. Um, it, it, it certainly, particularly for people who lived through um, those times of, of high interest rates, it creates a lot of concern. What, what, what do you think the, the, the um, lasting memories are from those eras and, and why does it drive so much com uh, concern within the community? I'm not quite sure um, what is causing consumer confidence that we talk about soon, but I think the fear of interest rates going up is playing a part in it. Mm. People want to, holding on to their, want to hold on to their money in case it's going to cost too much and interest rates go through the roof. And, and, and I think just to, you know, sometimes we talk about, I mean, there, there, there are people that probably watch this show and say, okay, interest rates have gone up, you know, what, why, why is that such a dire thing? Because we haven't actually seen that for a long time and there's a whole generation of people who haven't um, seen that. But what, what we're talking about here is that the, pro, the cost of borrowed money increases. So the, the flow on effect for those that are unaware is that mortgages uh, increase in their costs. And, and I mean, you know, the idea that your house is going to cost more and, and maybe your house is um, unaffordable is perhaps one of the most unsettling ideas, isn't it? That, you know, the, the house is such a, you know, it's a beacon of security in people's life and the idea that something may come between that, uh, you know, some, something might interfere with that security is a really daunting thought. It, it means that um, less people are likely to buy houses because they can see the cost going up. But the purpose of interest rates going up is really so that it sucks money out of the economy, which means less money is being spent on items, which lowers the pressure on the inflation rate. And that's what the Reserve Bank are doing. That's why they're increasing interest rates. Uh, you mentioned that it's going to have an effect on the number of people who want to purchase houses. And the ComBank uh, have uh, released their monthly uh, household spending um, indicator um, or spending intentions indicator and have a look at that, Roy, month on month. Um, the people who, um, and, and I should say that this index measures current and future spending trends 
and uh, they're sort of predicting that um, there's going to be a massive drop off in the number of people buying houses and the people who intend to buy houses. Yes, isn't that interesting? And, and looking at that slide, you see that travel has gone up through the roof and that's because we've come off COVID and we're just starting to spend more on travel. Maybe not a lot of international, but certainly a lot within Australia. Uh, that's quite interesting. And uh, gym memberships have dropped, mm. which I'm surprised given that we've come out of COVID. I think people have been eating and drinking a little bit more, less exercise. So that's an interesting one. Motor vehicles as well is the one that's, that's down. So perhaps some of the bigger purchases, house and, and car, um, the intention to buy those in, in the near future has gone down. And some of the others are, are sort of uh, trend dependent or, or um, you know, situation dependent. So as we move on to the, the actual index number, that one also fell um, after a, a, a seasonally strong March reading. So uh, perhaps a bit of a correction there that fell month on month. Uh, by 3.8 per cent. As I said, this, this index um, measures um, household spending intentions. So uh, I think cost of living, generally, it's been um, talked about throughout the election campaign, I think for households, Roy, uh, that's going to be something that um, is, is going to outlaw. The, the issues around cost of living are going to outlast the election campaign by a long way. I think it's something we're going to be talking about for the, for, for the rest of this year. Yes, I agree. I agree 100%. But interestingly, on that index, you see that it did decrease last month. And that's a good sign. If we could have a few more months of decreasing, again, that will help relieve some of the uh, pressures on the inflation rate. Uh, that's one indicator. But of course, the prize indicator that we look at on this show is consumer confidence. It's, uh, it's one that our audience uh, likes to see every month. And uh, it's in decline, Roy. It's perhaps you, you know to say it's in free fall is 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 too much, but it's certainly in uh, steady decline, and it's um, the sixth month in a row that this index has decreased. And isn't this curious? In, given that we've passed the real problems of COVID, mm. we've got past the worst of that. So I can only think what is causing this might actually be the fear of inflation. Because mm. uh, I'm not quite sure what everything, what else would be causing this confidence index to be dropping so much. The the consumer confidence index, um, as as it, it sort of um, suggests, is it measures um, you know how confident the community is about spending money into the future, um, and it, it it's sort of suggesting that um, small decreases across the board in terms of spending intentions. So people. I think people are, are keen to kind of hold on to, to money where they can. Um, the travel one, as we said in the in the ComBank um, indicator, is probably an anomaly. People need to go out for a holiday. They've been they feel like they've been, um, you know, stuck at home for a long time. But I think generally pe people are a little bit tentative at the moment. And you know what I think needs to happen from here is there needs to be some solid uh, fiscal leadership from government to say this is a path forward. This is what we're going to do. We're going to run this agenda. Um, and we're going to rebuild the economy from, from this point because uh, it is at a precarious uh, point. We've seen um, inflation um, at, a, at a high level. We're seeing interest rates um, on the increase uh, and people are, people are uncertain about what's going to happen. And, and as you say, that, there's that lingering, enduring memory of what a period of high interest rates looks like. Um, the unemployment rate, uh, Roy, has remained flat uh, for another month, 4% there as uh, you can see on the screen there. So, you know, uh, uh, it, that, and that's at sort of historical lows as well, like a large proportion of the, of the, um, the labour force or the uh, participation rate, um, sorry, I should, the participating labour force, I should say, um, is working and, and working at a level that they'd like. Interesting that that's flat. Um, there is certainly a feeling out in the businesses that we look after that there's labour shortages. And the labour shortages sort of infers to me that that in, uh, unemployment rate may drop a little bit in coming months. Interesting. Business confidence perhaps um, might be an indicator of, of how businesses are going in that space. Um, and that one dropped um, month on month, but it's still in the positive territory. And, and you can see that you know, there is precedent there for it to go from, from very high to, to very low uh, month on month, and, and businesses can react pretty quickly to, to, ever, to the, the changing environment. Yeah, this is a good sign for the economy, because if businesses are confident, then they're more likely to spend money on equipment, they're more likely to employ people. So that's a great sign. 
The, uh, the next part that we, that we look at is uh, housing prices across, across the country, and we've got some numbers here from CoreLogic. Um, Roy, there's, there's probably a couple of ways of looking at this, and we're reading in the, in the media at the moment, OK, housing prices, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne, they're flat, they're going to go down, there's going to be a dramatic housing crisis, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know, there's, I think, two ways of interpreting these numbers. So you can see that property prices month on month were 0.2% uh, down in Sydney, flat in Melbourne, 0.3% down in Hobart and up um, across, the, um, across the, uh, the rest of the capital cities and the five capital city aggregate. Um, and you can also see that the year on year that house prices are still significantly higher. Um, contrast that against um, the ASX uh, 200 graph, which we can see here, and we're talking about month on month change. Um, you can see that in April, the stock market had a, a pretty severe correction. So there's obviously more volatility in the prices um, that, or the pri on, on the value of the stock market than there is on, on property prices. And, and, and perhaps the, the media attention is, is, is unjustified. What do you think on that? I think from my experience, property prices, when they drop, they don't drop significantly like it does on the share market, which is that graph just showed us. I think property tends to level out. And the interestingly, the month figures where there's either break even or very small increase in, uh, decrease in Sydney, is, I think is evidence that we're, un in my opinion, we're unlikely to see 10% drops in property prices like some people predict. I think it's just going to level out. And it, I also believe we need it to level out because the increasing rate that we've had for the last two or three years during COVID, in times when we thought that it would fall off a cliff because COVID was going to, uh, JobKeeper was going to finish, um, I think this is a good thing. And I think property prices should, for the sake of the economy, level out uh, for some time. I think that's a great thing. We've spoken about cost of living um, on this show, um, on this episode, a lot already. But um, one thing I wanted to shine a light on was petrol prices. Um, and how Australia compares to the, uh, uh, the rest of the world of the G20 countries. Um, now, those prices there are in US dollars. Um, so, you know, Australia kind of sitting mid-table there comparatively. Um, prices higher in Japan, Turkey, India, South Africa, Canada and Brazil, but fra um, lower in, in the US, Mexico, China, Argentina, Russia, Saudi Arabia and Indonesia. Um, you know, so in terms of the, the, the price crunch, you know, that I, I think that, that that kind of makes sense, you know, in terms of where we sit because of um, geographically, there's, there's obviously, um, you know, a supply cost to get petrol to, to Australia. But what, do you, what do you make of that, Roy? I think the focus in the media is on Australia and that's all we look at because that's what we care about. But the reality is the pressures we're having in Australia on fuel prices that we just saw and on the inflation rate um, and on uh, labour shortages is not actually just an Australian problem. It's a global problem that many, many countries are experiencing. So we're not on our own when it comes to those figures. And, and there, as we said, as we saw at the top of the list, you know, countries like Russia, Saudi Arabia and the US even um, ahead of us, you know, they have access to, to oil and, and, and they, they, they process their own oil. So less supply costs, less costs passed on to the consumer. So some of it's justifiable. But, you know, I look at those results, I think, OK, yeah, that, that's about right. That, that makes sense. Uh, Roy, we've got a couple of guests coming up on the show today. Uh, Robert Williams from Your Brand Unleashed, and we're going to talk to Rick Tyrrell from RJS Packing, and we're going to ask them the hard questions. But before we do that, it's time to ask you the hard question because it's time for question time. Um, and we've had a viewer question come in that says, Roy, I have a small business. If I pay for a website, can I claim the full tax deduction in the year that I pay for it before 30 June? Well, normally with a website, we write the cost of the website off over time. But the government have brought in the instant asset write-off, which is in existence through till 30th of June 2023. So the answer is we can now claim the website in the year that the money is expended. With one proviso, which is the website must be actually up and running uh, in the financial year. So if you pay for it on the 30th of June and the website doesn't go live until the middle of July, you can't claim the cost until the following year. Keep that in mind. But there is another bonus that's available to us that got announced at the budget. And if you spend money on a website or any computer uh, hardware or software or programs, 
you actually get not just the tax deduction that you've spent, but you get an additional 20%, which means if you spend $100 on a website or computer stuff, you get a tax deduction for $120. So there's actually an incentive right now to go out, improve your website, or increase your technology standing for your business. And, and that seems to be a, a pretty um, strong push, isn't it, to you know, this idea of, of um, helping businesses um, move into the digital space. That's consistent with other grants that we've seen in the past and other, um, other programs, Roy, and you know, another incentive for, for, for businesses to go out and, and, and spend money on technology. Yes, 100% agree. Um, we're trying to make it a cleverer country uh, and make businesses uh, more techno technologically advanced. Uh, Roy, uh, we're going to speak to Rick Tyrrell about um, some tax planning matters, as I mentioned earlier, um, but you've got a bit of a tip for self-managed super funds. Um, do tell. What's the tip? Well, the tip, the tip is a big one, actually, because we, we know that interest rates are going up. We've seen the graph on that, and we're feeling it in the economy. Uh, all the banks are increasing their interest rates, except for anybody who has a self-managed super fund loan. So you may have a property in a self-managed super fund and you've borrowed money. Now, if that's the case, there's been very few lenders in that space. So the interest rates are generally around 5%. But in the last month or so, a number of new lenders have come into the market lending in this space. So competition has caused the interest rate for self-managed super funds to decline. We are now doing loans at around 3.5% for a self-managed super fund. So if you have a property and a loan in a self-managed super fund, contact us or your broker and at least get them to do, get some quotes because you more than likely will find you're going to save some considerable dollars for your self-managed super fund right now. There you go. Get onto that. And if you need some assistance, rjsanderson.com.au. Um, just backtracking a, a little bit, you, we, we talked about technology. There's a couple of boosts for small businesses and one of them being a, another uh, technology boost. Tell us about this one, Roy. Yeah, the technology boost is similar to what I just mentioned, 120%. Um, you've got to spend money. It can be portable payment devices, um, cyber security systems, cloud-based services. It can be like a zero subscription. Um, as long as your turnover is under 50 million, which is certainly going to be most businesses. I just want to make a... And there's two of these that we'll, we'll come to, but I just want to make a point that these actually aren't law yet, but the tax office are going to allow us to claim them on the assumption that they will become law because these were announced in the budget. We have a caretaker government as we speak. There will be an election, and the expectation is these will be passed at some point in the future. But if somehow an independent has uh, power of the balance of power and these are not passed, we will, even though we have lodged tax returns claiming these additional 20% incentives, the tax office will do an amendment to take them out. So keep that in mind. Interesting. There's another um, uh, incentive for small businesses that you want to talk about in terms of skills and training as well? Yeah, so this is the new trend in that budget where you get not just uh, a tax deduction for what you spend, but you get an additional 20%. This relates to eligible training courses provided to your staff members. Eligible training courses are defined by those that are performed externally to your business and are run by an RTO, Registered Training Organisation. And if you spend the money between budget night, uh, which was, weirdly enough, the, in the regulations, it says 7.30pm on March 29. That's when they started the, the budget announcements. Right through to the 30th of June 2023, you get the 120% deduction for the money that you spend on these registered training courses. Sorry, so Roy, you're saying that if you if you went out and bought a computer or bought a training uh, thing at 7.38, you're no good on that day, 7.38 p.m.? 7.38 p.m. is okay. That's after the budget lockdown at 7.30. Oh, oh right. 7.29, okay. if, no you've got a, if you've got a, um, a receipt from Harvey Norman because you bought a computer at 7.29, you lose it. Oh, jeez, that's... <laughs> That's stiff. That is that is very stiff. So you still get the hundred percent tax deduction. You don't get the additional twenty. So just a just a uh, bit of tax planning before we get to Rick Tyrrell. Um, you know, if you're thinking about buying something um, on budget day, just wait till after the budget lockdown starts, just in case these type of things uh, get announced. Um, Roy, a bit of a change of pace. Uh, we've got a special guest on the line, and it's fantastic to welcome Robert Williams from Your Brand Unleashed. Robert, thanks so much for joining us on RJ Sanderson TV. Thanks for having us on board. Robert, uh, tell us a little bit more about what your brand Unleashed is and what you guys do and what your main product is. 
Sure. Our, um, your Brand Unleashed is a printing and promotional products business. Uh, we're based here in uh, Victoria, but obviously uh, supplying nationwide and e even international. Um, our main sort of selling products uh, at the moment are IT and tech. IT and tech tend to be the most popular sort of promotional products, uh, as well as drinkware and notebooks and things like that at the moment. Robert, I, um, I love the website. It's fresh, it's vibrant, it's got products on it. It, it explains why we should use your business, 20 years experience. But it, um, uh, it lists out the Australian Promotional Products Association. It's an association I didn't even know existed. Uh, explain your link and involvement with the association. Yes, yeah, certainly. So we've been a member for 22 years of APA, which is the Australasian Promotional Products Association. Um, my involvement now is I'm actually the president of the board of the association. I've been president for the last couple of years and been on the board for uh, around seven years now. So it's a it's a great industry to be part of, a great association that represents our uh, promotional products companies and distributors uh, and suppliers all around Australia and New Zealand. I didn't realise we should be addressing you as president, Robert Williams, <laughs> but that's okay. Happy to do that. Uh, what's your Robert, what's your perfect customer? Is it small? Is it large? Uh, where do you fit? Perfect customer, who is it? Our perfect customer is probably someone who understands the use of promotional products and printing and what value that can bring to the business. So we uh, we do a whole gamut of small, medium and large business through to government and uh, a lot of charities and things like that as well. So there's no one too small and no one too large, but someone that actually understands the use and the ROI that promotional products and printing bring uh, to uh, the client's brand. I will say, Robert, um, we have used your services for some pro promotional stuff and it's uh, been awesome and a, a very good relationship and we were very happy with the transaction. Um, I'm curious I'm curious about with COVID, in general, were your customers spending less on the marketing and promotional stuff or more? What were customers doing? Customers were unfortunately spending less. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, obviously all events were closed down and most of our products were for um, brand launches, conferences, events, PD days, all of those sorts of things. So with those gone, we did see a dramatic drop to the business, but uh, we, we were lucky. We do a lot of uniform and printing programs for a lot of clients. And through that, we're able to sort of keep reasonably stable uh, throughout the whole patch because obviously uniforms and uh, printing were still required for customers that were open during that time. Robert, it sounds uh, like Roy is perhaps the perfect customer. Where do our other customers or potential customers go to find out more about you guys and what what uh, what exactly you guys do? Yeah, certainly. So the best point of contact is definitely our website first, which is yourbrainunleashed.com.au. Uh, or give us a buzz or shoot us an email. Um, email is promo at yourbrainunleashed.com.au. Robert, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate you joining us on RJ Sanderson TV. Thanks for having us. Robert Williams there from Your Brand Unleashed. Now, that was all pretty positive. But I feel like things are about to take a turn because it's time for a segment that I love every time we are here on RJ Sanderson TV. It's Roy's Rage. Uh, Roy, you were pretty positive and happy off the top after I mentioned the Blues win on the weekend. But um, now it's time you know, for you to tell us about what's got you frustrated and angry and upset this week. Yeah, there is, there is something, Dave, that's got my heckles up a little bit. There's a political party advertising at the moment that says that they will keep their interest rates at 3% for five years. Now, I'm not going to name who it is. It doesn't matter. It's not one of the bigger parties. And this is fear-mongering because in Australia, the Reserve Bank has been established to be independent of the political parties. So a political party has no say in what the interest rate will be. It's meant to be an economical decision, not a political decision. So it annoys me that we see advertising to try and get votes when really that political party, even if they get the balance of power, unless they make some significant changes in Australia, cannot keep that promise to keep interest rates at 3%. And that annoys me. I, I, I don't know, Roy. Maybe this um, smallish party is going to remodel the entire financial system and we're going to see a complete change to macroeconomics. Or maybe not. We could, oh. but I doubt it. <laughs> no, I agree with that, Roy. That, uh, that, that as, as you say, they're, they're sort of uh, pushing policy that they have no control over and, uh, and I think that that's um, you know, misleading for voters and I think that's happening in, in, in a couple of spaces. So keep an eye on that. Make sure that you know, when you go to the polls that you're, you're realistic about what, um, what the parties can actually offer. Right, time to turn our attention to another guest and Rick Tyrrell from RJS Pakenham um, is on the line. Rick, uh, welcomes. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, 
you are an expert in the tax planning area and uh, right off the top we want us to give want you to give us our your best tip for, for tax planning thanks David and Roy good to see you uh, well there's a couple of things that we we're right in the midst of tax planning at the moment and rolling that out in the next couple of weeks a couple of things that come to mind the first one is the temporary um, full expensing and that's that's a great tax tip for many, but the, most of the time it involves a, a getting a big loan. And secondly, that most clients don't want these days. And secondly, the, if you buy equipment and, or a motor vehicle, it has to be in use by the 30th of June, 22, to get the deduction in this year. So time doesn't really allow that greatly. The, our biggest tax tip, and it probably is most years, is superannuation. And why it's the biggest tax tip is the ATO have introduced over the last year or two a um, thing called the carry forward concessional contributions. Now, how that works is normally you get your 20, 25,000 a year, it's up to 27,500 this year as a tax deduction if you put that amount into super. Now, that includes your superannuation guarantee from your employer. Now, if you haven't done your twenty five thousand over the prior three years, you've got a, a carry forward contribution you can put into super. Now that can be quite substantial. The best thing about a super deduction is that you can put it in before thirtieth of June. Basically, it should go in a week before the thirtieth of June to make sure it enters the superannuation account before thirtieth of June. If you put it in on the twenty eighth or twenty ninth of June, it may not go through until the 1st or 2nd of July. So that's an important tip. But with the super deduction, we can look up on the ATO portal and for clients, they can look on their MyGov account, I believe, to look up their super and see what they've put in in concessional contributions over the last three years. So I've just printed out one from a client this morning. It tells me that, that their concessional contributions from 2021 back to 2019 were up. Uh, 17,000 only. So they can actually put in 57,000 as a deduction. Now, this can be a personal deduction out of their own pocket as well and claim it against their wages and salary, or it can be made through their business entity and get a full deduction on top of the 27 and a half that's available this year as well. So that, now the, the catch with that is your super balance has to be less than $500,000. So if you're already above that, you won't get those carry forward concessional contributions. Uh, most, pe most people probably, most clients generally have a less than $500,000 balance, so that is good. Rick. So that's my number one tax tip. Yep, the absolute gold, Rick. And I know when I see uh, the reports that you put together for clients along with other um, uh, partners within the organisation, there's a whole list of ideas for clients, but that they're, a, they're a couple with the uh, full expensing and the superannuation, really, really good tips. I'm curious, Rick, given um, you're close to the ground with business clients, one of the leading accounting firms in the Pakenham region, um, what's happening with businesses in general since COVID? Are businesses starting to recover or are they still struggling? What's your, what's your gut feel when you're talking to business clients? Well, fortunately, we haven't, as, as a firm, had many... Well, I can't think of any clients that have um, sort of gone to the wall, which is fantastic, but there's a few getting back on their feet. Now, the, their main saviour was the fact that they got JobKeeper, cash flow boost and grants, and some of them got the whole three. Others got variations of those amounts that really have saved them and meant that they've able to stay in business all this time during COVID, and now they're certainly getting back on their feet. I mean, there's a few industries that uh, are, are flat chat, like your building industry and trying to get materials and all that sort of stuff, that, which is causing a lot of um, price rises, et cetera. But generally the ATO, well, and the government have saved a lot of businesses from going under. Rick, you personally and RJS have a pretty close relationship with the Pakenham Racing Club. Um, what's your involvement and how long you've been involved with the Pakenham Racing Club? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, well, I've actually been on the board for six, about 16 years now, Roy, and um, started when we were at the old Pakenham Racing Club 
in right in the heart of Pakenham. We sold that and built a new $100 million track in Tynong, as most people would be aware of Follow Racing. And um, I've been involved in the, fortunately I was involved with the infrastructure of that and all the building. And um, in the last three years, I've been, I've been the vice chairman of the club. So it's, um, it's an honorary role. So I won't be leaving RJS to take on any positions at the Pakman Racing Club, Roy. Um, but it's a, it's a very big passion of mine and the club has um, ha been hugely successful. I was actually out at uh, the, the race course just last week, uh, Rick, uh, interviewing the great Peter Moody. Ten years, can you believe it, since uh, Black Caviar won at Royal Ascot. And uh, I Am Caviar, I think, trialled the other day, a, a, a son of the great mayor. So a fantastic facility and um, you know, plenty going on, a hive of activity there in the morning in, in, in particular. Rick, have you got a tip for us, um, you know, for, for anything coming up midweek or, or on the weekend? Well, I, don't, I get tips from everyone, Dave, unfortunately, and committee members, and you get them, and really, really the tips win. So I'm not prepared to tell <laughs> anyone. The only tip I would give is that our, our number one and two trainers, not necessarily in that order, but Peter Moody and Philip Stokes are based at Pakenham, and they have a lot of winners, and particularly on our own track. So if you're going to have a bet... Um, follow those two. When's, it, when's the next race meeting out at Packenham? Well, oh, we've got a meeting tonight, I believe, so I'm not going. I don't have to go to every meeting, but um, we, we have Thursday night meetings and they are a uh, big hit with the industry and um, a huge huge success. So well, we, we actually race on the synthetic um, track that we've got inside the grass track in the next couple of weeks. I think we start on that. We've been racing on the grass, so once winter comes... We race on the synthetic. Fantastic. Uh, Rick, thanks so much for the, the tax tip. I know plenty of planning that needs to go into it. So rjsanderson.com.au or get in contact with Rick at RJS Packenham. Uh, thanks for joining us today and appreciate your time. No worries. And remember, it's all about giving the ATO as less money as possible. <laughs> we'll keep that one thanks. in mind, Rick. Uh, appreciate your time. And I, I think that's, uh, that's everyone's ambition, Roy. They want, yep. You want to give as, as little tax as possible and, and keep it in your pocket. I 100% agree. And what I took from Rick was uh, put everything on Moody at Packenham because <laughs> he wins more often than not. Bet until your nose bleeds. No, no, only bet what you can <laughs> afford to lose. That's... That's what you should do. We should have asked um, Rick how much his investment was uh, on, on Carlton to win the, the flag in 2022 or whether he, he does have an investment in that. He, he's actually a Collingwood man. Oh, uh, we have low morals when we employ people at RJS. <laughs> but he's a very big Collingwood fan. There you go. Uh, Roy, it's been fun as always. Uh, plenty happening. We've chatted about uh, interest rates that historic moment where we finally had the rate rise. We've had plenty of uh, discussion. Politics um, at the forefront of it as well with uh, the election coming up. A big month ahead. Looking forward to next time already. Talk to you soon. rjsanderson.com.au for more information. Thanks so much for joining us on RJ Sanderson TV. We'll see you next time.